I hope you're ready to hear something truly, astoundingly great from Jesus, because we're going to do that. Prepare yourselves to hear great, great things from Jesus about Jesus, but ironically, these great things we're going to hear from Jesus about Jesus are greatly offensive to the sensibilities of pop culture around us and to whatever degree you're influenced by the culture you are around. Um, they may be a bit offensive to your sensibilities, but you've come to the right place because we're going to allow Jesus to tell us who he is, uh, what's right, what's true, what's honorable, and it'll give us an opportunity to bring our thinking and our hearts in line with ultimate reality. So I hope you're ready to do that. So this morning we'll be in Matthew 11. So Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew, 11th chapter, and we're going to look at 11 verses. We're going to look at verses 20 to 30, and more than likely this is going to be part one of two parts for next week. Hope you're ready. Here we go, beginning in verse 20, Matthew 11. Then he began to, den to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What we're going to do is work our way through this text of Scripture and be able to identify three great roles that Jesus occupies. Three great roles that he occupies. He occupies the role of judge, he occupies the role of son, and he occupies the role of Sabbath or rest. And the reason we're probably going to have this be a two-parter is because the rest part is so good and important, and I love it so much that there just isn't enough time. So we'll probably uh, have to save that. But I, I wanted to tackle this whole thing together. Tackle, not a good illustration. I wanted to cover all this together because it helps us to hopefully see things in balance. Um, Jesus is, his, his, he doesn't have one attribute and his one attribute is love. He doesn't have one attribute and his attribute is wrath or, or justice or righteousness. No, Jesus is the one and only Savior who's different than we might ordinarily expect. So role number one that's great and important is the role of judge, the role of judge. There aren't very many voices in the world around you other than Christian voices that would remind you that Jesus is a great judge. But the fact of the matter is, if we're uh, ignoring revisionist history, even in our own minds and paying attention to Scripture, he's definitely a judge. Even as the Messiah, the one who we've been waiting for, the world has been waiting for, he's definitely a judge, and we're going to get a dose of his being a judge this morning. So let's go ahead and jump in. Verse 20, then he began to denounce. That means pronouncing guilt upon someone or some place. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. And I want to rudely interrupt there for effect and say, that seems strange. That seems odd. The very places where he did all of these things for people to see time and time again, graciously, wonderfully, powerfully, objectively verifiable. He denounced those places? Well, let's keep reading and we see why it happens. 
because they did not repent. So he's denouncing the cities. That doesn't mean there weren't any believers in the cities because some of his disciples were from some of, some of those cities. But by and large, the people who are witnessing him doing these great things for them at no fee, proving that he was, uh, is who he claims to be, by and large, they met them with him with hostility. They didn't repent. They didn't have a, in other words, since we don't use the word repent very often, they didn't have a change of heart. They, 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 they wouldn't admit that they're wrong. They wouldn't admit that they're sinners. They wouldn't admit that Jesus is more than someone who was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth, more than a teacher, more than a prophet. So they wouldn't repent. They, they, they weren't in a place where they would say, I'm not fit for his kingdom. I'm not ready for him. Ultimately, I'm not, I don't need him to save me as he came to save his people from their sins. They, they, they wouldn't repent. I'm okay the way that I am. In our day, we would say what so many counselors tell people, you know what you need to do first and foremost? You need to be true to yourself. Well, these folks were all about being true to themselves. The problem is if you're a sinner, you've broken God's law, you're not ready for the king, you're not ready for the kingdom, the worst thing in the world, the most anti-gospel thing in the world would be to be true to yourself. What they need to do is say, we've got a problem. We need to be spared. We need to be forgiven. We need to be rescued. But they did not repent, and so Jesus pronounces condemnation upon them. It assumes they're wrong. It assumes they're in trouble. It assumes they're broken. It assumes they're not okay the way they are. And then comes a logical next step. Verse 21 says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, the surrounding cities in the Galilee region. Woe to you. Woe to you. Wo woe, to, wo woe to you means disaster be upon you. Pain and infliction. It's a, it's a statement of condemnation. It's really, really strong. Terrible pain, horror, hardship, dis distress. This is, it's calamitous. It's bad. And Jesus... Again, it might not be the Jesus of our imagination. It might not be the Jesus we learned about in Sunday school. But, but Jesus is the one who pronounces woe to those who don't repent. It's going to be bad. You think your life is bad now? You think the Romans are oppress oppressing you and things are bad now? I'm pronouncing condemnation upon you. This is, this is intense. This is hardcore. My question for a moment is to ask you, why? Did, did Jesus have a bad day? Um, did, did Jesus have some issues so he just needed to unleash on these people? Or No, Jesus, in, in Jesus-like fashion, you can call Jesus a lot of things, but you can't call him unreasonable. You can't call him irrational. You can't call him uh, illogical because let's keep going. Here's why. Here's the rationale. Verse 21 says, For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, so infamous place, for Baal worship, for pagan idolatry in the Old Testament, Isaiah 23, Ezekiel 27 and 28, Tyre and Sidon. If the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. There's rationale. I've done all this before you to prove it, and you've seen. And what have you done? In our day, you'd say, don't confuse me with the facts. I know what I believe. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. So to make his point, he's saying, if, if these things would have been done in that place that you all think is a bad place, according to the Old Testament, where, where people were, were completely lost spiritually and doing crazy outlandish things, he's saying, you know what? They, they would have repented. And not only, they wouldn't have repented like this. They wouldn't have done our, our, our uh, uh, I'm sorry if I did anything wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended you, right? Those kind of faux apologies where we don't actually admit guilt. Uh, no, th they would have repented with sackcloth and ashes. The, the, the way in their day, they, they would externally admit guilt. I'm wrong, I'm wrongheaded, I've got a problem, and I'm not gonna just hide it and put on a happy face. I'm gonna show you I'm guilty. It's pretty intense stuff. They would have admitted that they were wrong a long, a long time ago.
Remember, not just to touch base with, with those of you who are older, um, and there might be one in the room, I'm not sure, but um, as old as I am or older or thereabouts, um, I always think of happy days when I think of this, and I always think of Fonzie, Arthur Fonzarelli, right, the coolest cat around, the black leather jacket, he was the man, right, and I've used this before, but I can't resist. He had done something that he shouldn't have done, and so it's time for him to make, come clean, and so he, what does he do? I just want you to know that I was, right, and then so then he musters it, I, I, I just, hey, I, I was, he can't say it, right? He can't, he can't admit guilt. Because if he admits guilt, he admits he's not, pers- he, he's not perfect. And so in this case, even the Baal worshipers, even, even they would have admitted that they're wrong with a capital R. I said it on accident first service, and people said, make sure you keep saying it that way because it has a better effect. (laughs) Sometimes I get too comfortable up here, I guess. Verse 22 says, but I tell you, notice the fine sharp point here, I tell you it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. There is a day of reckoning. There is a day of final judgment. There's something in the human heart that even wants there to be such a day where wrongs are accounted for, but what we don't want to be is in their spot because Jesus says, you know, you religious people, it's going to be worse for you on that day. Pretty intense. Not pretty intense, very intense. In principle, we we talk about this like, like this. To whom much is given, much is required. And that's a true biblical principle. It's true in life. So the Baal worshipers, Jesus isn't giving them a free pass, Tyre and Sidon. That was wrong. But now they're sinning against a greater revelation, more revelation, a greater light against the sun. And I would venture to say to you that it still rings true today. It rings true for you if you sit and hear the good news of salvation in Christ week in and week out, day in and day out, whether it's for me or a friend or an enemy or a family member. To whom much is given, much more is required. It's sobering, but it is important. Then the question comes in verse 23. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? How about that for a question? Chapter 4, verse 13 tells us Jesus grew up in, no, excuse me, he grows up in Nazareth. His adult life, he lives in Capernaum. So are you going to be exalted to the highest high Capernaum, right? When you drive through some of these towns, small towns, sometimes big cities, you know, welcome to Capernaum, byline, adult home of Jesus. We're awesome. We're on the map. People flock here from all around. We're going to see where Jesus lived. What an, that's the greatest city ever. He says in verse 23, you will be brought down to Hades. So you think you might be real high on the list? You're actually going to be at the lowest low on the list, the place of the dead. So it's intense. It's no wonder they crucify him. Then for some rationale, again, it's so classically Jesus to be rational. Verse 23 says, if we keep going, for, again, reason, rationality, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, that's not so infamous. That's more famous. We, we, we know that even if we don't know the Bible very well. Oh, that's Genesis 19. That bad actors, injustice, really, really, really bad. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Wow. Ever so quickly, my question to you is, what what are we learning so far about Jesus? What does this tell us about Jesus? And I think we could come up with a long list. I have a short list, 
You can elaborate on the list, but I always like to do that. When I work through a passage like this, I want to step back and say, well, what does this tell us about Jesus? Ever so quickly, it tells us that Jesus affirmed the authenticity of the Old Testament as true history. It tells us that Jesus is just. There is consequence for sin, even greater consequence for greater sin. So he's fair. It tells us Jesus is the judge who has authority to judge. It tells us that it is of utmost importance to, to think rightly about him and to repent regarding him. It tells us that it is an awful thing to reject the revelation of Jesus as the Christ. It tells us that Jesus even knows the hypotheticals. He knows so much, he knows how it would have turned out for those places if they'd seen his revelation. It tells us something about how much we need Jesus as a substitute. It tells us something about ourselves and how we naturally drift so far away from the biblical Jesus that we hear these words and they're shocking. It tells us a lot of things. It also tells me that I can't wait for the ending of chapter 11. <laughs> when it's not woe, but gracious, kind invitation to rest for those who repent. Can't wait for that. Let's move on now to the second role of Jesus that we're going to be thinking is great, I hope. Number two, the greatness of Jesus as the Son. The greatness of Jesus as the Son. Verse 25 says, At that time, Jesus declared, and he's going to declare, declare this in a prayer. I don't really like it when people declare things in prayers, unless it's Jesus, <laughs> right? You know, you know what it's like. You're going to pray with somebody, and just they're, just they're just preaching. And you're like, really? Could we just pray here? And I digress. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying. Everybody, n never mind. I'm, I just dug myself in a hole. Good intention or not. I almost said everybody has good intentions, and I know that wasn't true. Let's get back to the text. It's good when Jesus declares things in a prayer because he's going to declare the right things, okay? That's what I wanted to say. Verse 25, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I want to pause there just for a moment to realize the, the, the grandeur of what he's praying uh, he's thanking his father, and who does he see his father as? His father is many things, but his father, here he's emphasizing, is Lord, sovereign, king, in charge, and all-powerful over heaven and earth. And so he's being inclusive extensive, exhaustive, I, praying to his father who's the Lord over everything that is. He's, he's the great grand God. And so he's declaring to that one, that'll become important in a moment. It's important in and of itself, but there, there are consequences to that. Then let's keep moving after the comma, that you have hidden these things. So he thanks his father that he's hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. 26 says, yes, father, for such was your gracious will. And now, at the risk of being struck by lightning, I want to offer a little pushback for effect because there's something in me, probably you too, that when we hear that God, how did he say it? Has hidden things. We want to say, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are hiding things from people? We want to sit in judgment of God. The great thing about the question is, Jesus answers the question before that text. Earlier on, I de he declares, I want to thank you. He praises his Father, right? Lord of heaven and earth. There's the answer. Who does this God think he is? He thinks he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He thinks he's above it all. He thinks he's in charge of it all. He, God has a God-like complex because he's God. And Jesus doesn't see it as bad pushback, how dare you, because Jesus knows who he is. He's the Lord of heaven and earth, so this God can do whatever he wants to do. It's his. It's, it's, it's actually amazing and staggering. And, it's, it, and it makes me uncomfortable. 
I hope in a good way. Makes me think of Romans chapter 9. Who are you, old man, who answers back to God? But here it's in a positive. But just realize Jesus, who, who doesn't have a, a sin nature, or mixed motives, he's thinking clearly as the God-man. Thank you that you have concealed and revealed. Lord of heaven and earth. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. I, I just want to remind you, sometimes we, when we talk about God, I think it's helpful to talk about God has edges. Um, he's not under our thumb. Uh, he, he's not someone we've created in our own image according to our own likings. <laughs> we wouldn't worship him if he was, or we shouldn't. He's Lord of heaven and earth, and Jesus sees that as good, and therefore he sees his actions as good. Or I like to say, he's not domesticated. He's not tame. He's God. And so it rattles our little cages, but here Jesus is on the right track, no doubt, when he says this as the son, the son. Uh, do notice that he's, uh, this is, God does have a will. God's will is gracious in verse 26. So God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has a will. Uh, history's going somewhere. And according to his will, he's revealed these things. These things have to do with Jesus being the Savior, Jesus being the Messiah, Jesus being the forever ruling, reigning King, Jesus being the judge. He's revealed these things graciously according to his gracious will to little children. I would maybe point out to you, I think it would be helpful, in 1042 earlier, the disciples are likened to children. So, yes, God's kingdom includes children. I'm not saying that's not true, but he's already started likening the disciples to children, okay? Childlike faith, um, not those who provide for themselves, not those who are powerful in and of themselves, those who are needy, need to be cared for. Isn't it amazing that God has revealed gospel truths to people like these disciples, people who are childlike? That's God's gracious will to do that. Now let's talk about grace, let's talk about fair, let's talk about pushback, let's step back a little again and say a few things, make some observations. We might want to say this isn't fair. I want to, I want to remind you he's Lord of heaven and earth. But I also want to remind you about what fair is. For the sons and daughters of those who of Adam. According to Romans chapter 5, just a great summary of everything taught in the old and in the new, we all deserve, we're all under fair condemnation. Okay? That's fair condemnation. Salvation is gracious. So let, let, me, let, me, let me push a little bit more. Um, Sometimes in the new members class, we're reading through our doctrinal statement, which talks about things like this in different ways. And, and I like to say, to be provocative, would it be fair for God to damn everyone? The answer is yes. Just condemnation for everyone. That would be fair so fair that the angels could praise God in heaven for condemning everyone who's ever lived because we're all sons and daughters of Adam. God would be righteous. God would be just. That's not, you don't hear that from very many voices in the world around you. Romans 5, New Testament. Then let me push a little bit more. Not because I'm mean-spirited, though I am. <laughs> Not because I'm trying to offend you, but I actually want you to come to grips with how, how great Christ is. So, would it be gracious for God to damn everyone and then choose to rescue one? See, our, our, our natural knee-jerk inclination would be, that's not fair. Well, fair is condemnation. Gracious is he saves anybody. It would be amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Everybody deserves condemnation, and God, Lord of heaven and earth, chose to rescue one. 
Amazing grace. Now, I'm done pushing it with you. He, he saved more than we can count, according to the book of Revelation. More, more, more than we can even fathom, right? All different kinds of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, race, people. He's a great savior in lots of different ways, even when it comes to breadth. But my, my whole, and it's because Jesus is a great savior, mighty to save. But my whole point is to give you a little pushback if this leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Jesus doesn't have a bad taste in his mouth. I thank you, Father, that you've chosen to not reveal this to those who are the wise and the noble, the ones you would think could earn it. And you have chosen to reveal it to those who are helpless and who would never earn it and the ones you wouldn't be invited, invited naturally. That's not problematic. It's still gracious. And in theology, we even talk about how the study of God and his ways. God doesn't have to do anything to the wise and mighty. They're already worthy of condemnation. He can simply pass over. Dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2. So I thought you all looked like you needed a little theology lesson. I'd love to do a whole seminar on this. Because if we really realize what's fair... We won't want it. We'll want what's gracious. And we'll look to Christ. But Jesus himself is pleased that God has a will. And that will is revealing to some and not to others. I would be lying to you if I didn't say there's an aspect of mystery to it. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say it's baffling to the mind. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't point it out to you in Scripture. There it is. God is dangerous. He's gracious. He's not tame. But he's good. He's good, and Jesus thinks he's good. Let's move on to verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. That... that that is staggering to the mind, right? All things related to judging, all things related to saving, all things with related to, if I think in my mind to like Colossians, reconciling all things in the end. That these, it's all been entrusted to me. This helps us to see that Jesus is the son. Jesus isn't a son. Jesus isn't one way. Jesus isn't one prophet. Jesus isn't one among many. If all things related to salvation have been given to him, He's the one you should be believing in, and he's the one I should be believing in. This is amazing. Jesus doesn't show up and say, I'm one among many ways. No. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. This is Daniel 7-esque, by the way. We won't take the time to go there. But in Daniel 7, the ultimate Messiah will have power and dominion over all, and it will last forever. All things. Verse 27 says, if we keep reading, and no one knows the Son except the Father. So think of the re unique relationship that family members have. I think that analogy will help us. No one knows um, closely, relationally, like a father-son relationship, an immediate family relationship. No one knows the Son except the Father. Then we keep going in that mindset. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And, and this is the kicker and, this is, this is the good news gospel and, okay? That, the first part of that is not gospel. It's true, but it's not gospel. If the first part is true and that's all we know, this isn't helpful to us at all. But if we keep reading, and anyone who, to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So now, if the Son, who's been given all things, if he reveals the Father to us, to the disciples, to those who are like children, we know the Father in a unique, intimate, familial, family kind of way, which is our greatest need. I don't know how I can't get excited about this. This is amazing. So you've got some pretty serious exclusivity, and then the Son giving revelation to whom he chooses to reveal him. I want to be part of that anyone. I'm look, looking forward to that invitation he's going to give at the end because I want to be part of the anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal him. 
Because that's how one comes to truly know God. In Matthew chapter 16, to look ahead in our minds a little bit, remember they're in Caesarea Philippi, and and Jesus is asking the disciples, who do you say that I am? And they say, well, some people say this, some people say that. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus doesn't say, Peter, it's a good thing you're smart for a fisherman. He doesn't do that. Peter, it's a good thing you, you've really been paying attention. That might be true, but ultimately, what does he say? He says this in verse 17, and Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Supernatural conclusion. Again, not that there weren't facts, there were facts. But to, have your, to, to come to the right conclusion is a supernatural reality. And the Father made it known to him. And we know, based upon our text, the Father through the Son. And if we go elsewhere, the Father through the Son, through the, through, through the Spirit of Christ. Triune God is involved. One is emphasized here. Supernatural reality. It's exciting stuff. Very exciting stuff. One more thing before we move on to that greatness of Jesus as the Sabbath. In case you didn't get enough controversy, I need to just kind of give you some more. Do notice anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Do know the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth has a Son. He's given all things to the Son, including all power. And now the Son even acknowledges that He freely chooses to give the saving reality. Again, might not be what you learned in Sunday school. I don't have all the answers to all your questions. But it does say that. And so I would say to a world that says it's all about us. We're free, 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 free. Well, last time I checked, we're bound by sin. We're bound by sin. You know who's free in salvation? The Son is free. The Son is free to give salvation to whom He, didn't you hear the word? Jesus said it, to whom He chooses. That, that, that's interesting. (laughs) It's controversial. The Son is free to do what he wants with salvation. It's fascinating. He's greater than we probably even imagine. If I've experienced, if I'm part of the anyone, if you're part of the anyone, how about this? Instead of trying to be arrogant and sit on judgment because the son said he chooses, how about being thankful? How about saying, I don't know the ins and outs. I don't know exactly how or why. Or, You know what? I'm thankful to be part of the anyone. I'm really thankful to be part of the anyone and have it fuel your praise. Sort of like the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. He's falling over himself, praising God unhinged in a good way because he's come to dabble in these realities. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And he just goes on and on and on. And he's talking about God choosing. And heavy matters. Let's move on now. No more controversy, I promise. (laughs) Our natural bent is to get all this wrong. It's good that Jesus speaks Let's move on to number three. Another great role of Jesus is Jesus as Sabbath. Jesus as Sabbath. I'm using that word on purpose to be a bit provocative because he's our rest, and that's the word for Sabbath. And so let's go ahead and read beginning in verse 28. Come to me, Jesus says, gracious invitation. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. Best part, best part of the whole day for me, and I will give you rest. Best part because (laughs) you need rest and I need rest. And I'm just so happy to get to this part and say, Jesus says, and and he's going to go on to say it's for your soul. So yes, he's using a physical analogy, which we'll talk about, but it's rest for your soul. So 
People look for rest in this and that and the other thing. We look for ultimate fulfillment in all of these different things. And then maybe we find, and so it's going to be this relationship and that relationship and politics and sports and education because I'm going to finally be at the place where I've arrived. <sighs> and, and then maybe we move on to religion. And, and if I could just do enough and try hard enough and then other people get in our lives and they tell us all the principles we need to follow and all the examples we need to follow. And if we can just do enough following biblical principles, then we're going to eventually get there and eventually God's going to accept us. That, that's the big picture. And Jesus says, come to me. I, I will give you rest. And the Bible describes him actually as the ultimate Sabbath. That's Colossians. In Colossians, the Sabbath and all of these other things are types and shadows, anticipating something greater. He's the substance. He's the Sabbath. He's the rest. He's the one who fulfills all the obligations. Isn't it interesting also, Jesus doesn't come along and say, and I just want you all to know that, you know, God's law is bad, God's requirements are bad, uh, and, and so I'm just going to lower the standard, and, and then you can make it. No, remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Unless you're perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. It was always true, but Jesus comes and, and, and blows the dust off and makes it clear for everybody to see. And so then what does he do? He fulfills it. I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. He does all of the right things on behalf of everyone who would ever believe. He goes to the cross to make atonement for us in all of our violations of God's standards. He's raised from the dead, proving that it actually is true and right, and he did it, and he's successful. This is how, this is how he can say, come to me, and I, in my person, will give you rest. It is extraordinary. It is great. It is ultimate Sabbath rest. Nothing greater than that. Come to me, and I will give you rest. All who labor and are heavy laden, think about the worst job you've ever had. Sorry to do that to you. It's a Sunday. I, I, I came here for peace. I promised peace here. Now I'm asking you to, to go there. Some of you have no doubt, no doubt had worse jobs than others, worse than me, harder, worse bosses or whatever, but we can all say, you know what, I've had a bad job in my life. Even if you're young and it's a job your parents gave you. My worst job was when we were burying fiber optic cable. I did it for summers and summers and summers, and they were redoing Sorensen Parkway at 30th Street and redoing all the roads and putting in the highway. And, and so my tyrant boss, um, let's call him Leroy Johnson because that was his name. Um, oh, he had a sign above his office door, Reverend Leroy Johnson. Uh, he was anything but, he, anyway, I stopped. So he, he, he bids a job that our company couldn't handle, and so before you know it, it's one month straight doing manholes and fiber op building manholes and fiber optic cable, 92 and a half hour work weeks. It'd be dark on the way, dark on the way home, fall asleep on the way, fall asleep on the way home. It was bizarre and amazing, good money, but bizarre and amazing, and to watch men cry, grown men, I was 18, watch grown men cry and quit their jobs because they were at the breaking point. They were so burdened and heavy laden. Now, you may have had harder jobs than me. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get in a contest. But that was my worst one. He uses the image, this worst, tyrannical boss, all of this weightiness, awfulness, deadlines, whatever it is that's going to make it terrible. And he says, you know what? There's a day off better than a day off. And he uses it to make a spiritual point. I'll give you rest. Rest for your souls. It's a great, great image of him as the gracious Savior. Augustine in his confession said this, you have made us for yourself. He's talking to God. You have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. That's a great quote. Look at all the things we do and all the things we're a part of and we're trying to find ultimate meaning, fulfillment, rest, if you will. 
And it's never going to happen until you see Jesus as the worthy one and then you come to him and you find rest for your souls in him. I kind of like all of the other things because it proves the point that Augustine's trying to make. Just look at, look at the world around you and everybody's trying to find fulfillment. Everybody's trying to find peace and happiness and nirvana or whatever, whatever you want to call it. There's this longing desire that only, only and forever Christ can meet. I'm going to go to him and I can finally have rest. God's not against me anymore. He's for me in his son, Jesus. We won't take the time to do it. I would love to do it. But in the Davidic covenant, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8, maybe we'll do it next week. And following, we have our word that's used uh, for rest. And it's in regard to the ultimate David. Remember Matthew 1, Jesus comes in the line of David. The ultimate David promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7, ruling and reigning forever. And as he rules and reigns forever as the all-powerful, all-wise, uh, generous king, there's rest for his people, okay? There, there, there's, no, no, there's no accident that that's the, the, the word that's used there. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, we call it the Septuagint, 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's fascinating. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And it's that place where he says, let's see, I'll read it. Verse 11, chapter 7, verse 11. From the time that I appointed judges over my people of Israel. No, it's this one. And I will give you rest. There's our Greek word in the Greek version from all your enemies. And we know the ultimate enemy, according to the New Testament, is death and what surrounds death. As you can tell, I'm having far too much fun, too excited to Stop, but we better finish. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. So using that image of oxen working together, plowing a field, pulling a cart, take my yoke upon you, Jesus says, and learn from me. So he's, he's the elder oxen, if you will, in context. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Okay, be discipled by me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. We know that doesn't mean weak and powerless. We've already seen he's the, the judge with all authority. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Think about the fact that there still is a burden. There still is work to be done. But think about the fact that it's a light burden. If you're united to Christ by faith, the burden of doing good is light. Think about it with me. Why would it be light? The burden of doing good is light because your salvation doesn't depend upon it. God requires perfection. You don't meet the requirement. It's a terrible burden. If Jesus is your Savior who's given you rest... Now the burden is light. Isn't it interesting? He, he's using discipleship metaphors, right? You, come, come work alongside of me and see how it's done. It's great to see that we're discipled by one who is, before he's our discipler, is our rest. So we rest in him and then we work with him. Not reverse. It's what makes it light. It, it's what makes this sermon a Christian sermon. Because we trust in the perfect work of Christ for our rest, and then we work, and now our work is light because our salvation doesn't depend upon it. It changes everything. It changes everything.